Tak, dobrý den. Vítám všechny, kteří nás sledují na Good morning. I would like to welcome all of you who follow us on the YouTube channel and all of my colleagues who will be speaking today. My name is Libor Svoboda and I work in the Institute of Study for, of Totalitarian Regimes and I will host this panel. Mm, the first presentation is by Stanislav Kokoška, who works in the same institute as I do, and he also works in the Institute for Contep Contemporary History of the Academy of Science. And he will present us his piece entitled uh, From Radical Opposition to Hegemony. One of the fundamental factors that enabled the communists to achieve a landslide victory in the May 1946 elections is considered to be the way in which they were able to present their resistance activities during World War II. This view may have been influenced by Fuchik's report written on the news, but the presentation of the communist resistance did not deviate from the norm at the time. Even Josef Smrakovsky, who made the following remark at the meeting of the Communist Party in February 1946, would have disagreed with this view. He said, I quote, I want to draw attention to the need for our party to look backwards in preparation for the Congress and the elections, in addition to looking forward. I feel that the party has not made use of the great work that the communists created during the occupation. End of quote. Looking for my PowerPoint presentation that I wanted to share with you, but I can't find it now. That's always the trouble with me when it comes to technical things. Hold on a second and I will try to find it. To je v pořádku. Když tak my to zapneme, můžeme zapnout tady. Jo, my to zapneme tady, Stando, to bude asi nejrychlejší. Jo, dobrý. Klidně, můžeme mluvit. Klidně mluv, já se omlouvám, že to skočil. A my to no, no, to je, to je, no, je, tam spíš jde o to, že prostě ty obrázky jsou na přeskáčku, ale... Uh, jako... slides don't really match what, what I'm saying, so you might get confused if it's you um, screening it, but... I will, I will just speak without it. Then, on the occasion of the 8th Congress of the Communist Party held in March 1946, the publication 10 Historical Years was published, summarizing developments since the previous Congress in 1936. However, the historical passages were brief, very shallow, and could not be compared with the amount of data used to describe the activities of the Communist Party and the Liberated Republic. It was logical. The resistance passed had legitimized all the permitted political parties of the post-war parliamentary system, so now the present and the future were the main issues. The communist resistance was characterized by two basic elements. It never retreated from the existence of an independent political party, and at the same time, throughout the occupation, it devoted considerable efforts to the ideological training of its members. The first principle, given by its mere affiliation to the Moscow Comintern, successfully shattered all notions of a total restructuring of the pre-war political system. Whether it was Benesch's concept of three parties to represent the left, the political center and the right, or the concept of the petitionary committee, we will remain faithful, which wanted to establish, I quote, a system of small number of parties based on the real opinion and social stratification of the population, end of quote. <laughs> 
In 1943, when the Moscow leadership of the Communist Party was already integrated in the political system in exile, this intransigence turned into an advantage. If one wanted to set up an illegal leading body in the protectorate, one had to make sure that it also had a communist representative in its leadership. This factor first became apparent in the formation of the Preparatory Revolutionary National Committee, which wanted to build on the work of the former central leadership of the Home Resistance, which had been broken up by the Gestapo in autumn of 1941. Then, at the end of the war, the last communist leadership le legalized by the Czech National Council by its participation, thus taking out the picture, some other illegal elements whose similar attempts were perceived as competitive. Similar clashes also took place in the formation of some of the national committees that were preparing to take power in the last days of the occupation. The emphasis on ideological training of the membership was directly related to the change of course of the Comintern that took place in 1939 in connection with the outbreak of World War II. This was a well-known ideological turn when Czechoslovak communists were required to launch an agitation against Edvard Beneš for his activities on the side of the so-called Western imperialists. Already in early December 1939, the illegal central leadership of the Communist Party of Czechoslovakia stated the following, I quote, Great weaknesses. The party is not yet politically and ideologically firmly united and completely clearly oriented. The struggle against Benesh, chauvinism and reformism is weak. End of quote. And then, in the spirit of the lesson that the prerequisite for Bolshevik activity is knowledge of terror, the relevant resolution was quoted, I quote, to publish more frequently Dimitriev's article, War and the Working Class, in Czech, Slovak, German, 30,000 copies, to publish at least part of the history of the Communist Party of the Soviet Union, end of quote. I have quoted this document for the reason that the history of the Communist Party of the Soviet Union became the key training material of the communist resistance until the end of World War II. This was true not only of the well-known youth resistance organization, but also, for example, of the partisan group Prokop Holi, which operated in the Brno region. A typical example from the final phase of the war, however, is the underground group Active, which cooperated with both Predvoj and the underground circle around the future Czech National Council. It was recruited from former members of the National Working Youth Movement and the Brevnov group of the National Labour Party. These were mainly left-wing social democrats and national socialists who had come into conflict with the illegal communist party. One of the key figures was Jaroslav Havelka, who edited the ideological library Red Asset, or whose various articles and training materials, or wrote various articles and training materials. After the war, he served in the leadership of social democracy, prepared the merge of the party with the Communist Party after February 1948, was a member of parliament and held various government posts. As historian Prokop Tomek has recently pointed out, even the Czechoslovak BBC broadcasts from London gradually changed their thematic scope so that Soviet propaganda also appeared in them. Meanwhile, in exile, Gottwald's foreign leadership became involved in the provisional state system and began to prepare for the role of a so-called state-forming political party. This was a clear tactical transition to a position of parliamentary democracy. Moreover, this shift was underlined in March 1944 by the formation of a bloc of three socialist parties which was to become the political representative of all working classes. That the convergence of programs for the new republic was not difficult even for the National Socialists can be seen in the Most Initiative which was set up in December 1943. This was a discussion platform which was to try to transform the original Clofage party in such a way as to make it universally appealing. In the actual formation of the socialist bloc, traditional practical politics was crucial for the National Socialists. Minister Jaroslav Strank 
Zelensky spoke openly about this on May 15. I quote, we imagined that the national committees would be formed on the basis of an agreement, that even the elections would be carried out on the basis of an agreement, that it would not be an electoral struggle, and that we would prepare a new constitution and electoral rules, and then we would go into election, just a competition, not a struggle. In short, that it will be friendly, and no one will try to take the other by surprise. In the Czech lands, as not only Jaroslav Stransky was immediately convinced upon his arrival in liberated Prague, a much more radical situation prevailed. The renewed leadership of the National Socialists was not admitted to the emerging Czech National Council. Senator Franja Zeminova was not co-opted to the successor Provincial National Committee and Mayor Petr Zenkel could not return to Prague City Hall. The so-called revolutionary changes which tried to eliminate its well-known First Republic competitors, were responsible for everything. Franja Zeminova, who was never far from sharp expressions, expressed this in a private letter from the end of May 1945. I quote, Not everything is as we imagined it and as we longed for it. There is a lot of terror everywhere from the communists, who would prefer to be the only party in the nation. The war has lasted too long and the minds of too many people have gone off the rails. It is almost laughable to me that in the end there may still arrest us for all our revolutionary activities and convictions." End of quote. Similar problems were also involved in the renewal of social democracy. Prague Radio, which was under the control of the Czech National Council, refused to broadcast a call for a meeting of its former officials, which was to take place on 10 May 1945. The situation was even more acute in Plzeň, where Luděk Pik, a prominent pre-war official, tried to rebuild the social democracy after the uprising. He came into conflict with the communist vice chairman of the Revolutionary National Committee, Václav Herbeck otherwise also a member of the Czech National Council. The latter told Pick that the social democracy would not be renewed because a United Workers' Party would be formed. When Ludek Pick refused to give up his intention even then, he was temporarily sentenced to house arrest. This was the most important incident, which was also discussed in a roundabout way by Clement Gottwald on 12 May 1945 at an activist meeting with Prague communist fact functionaries. According to Bohuslav Lashtovichka's remarks, the whole hall applauded enthusiastically when Gottwald spoke of the fact that, I quote, the broad layers of workers and former social democrats from some regions, such as Pilsen, do not wish the restoration of social democracy and that they want the immediate unification of all workers into one party, end of quote. There was then complete silence when Gottwald describes the immediate merger of the two parties as a fundamental mistake. In fact, the convened activity served primarily to explain to the comrades that the socialist revolution on the agenda was not a socialist revolution along the lines of the Communist Party of Soviet Union, only the creation of its preconditions in the form that the successfully promoted Kociuszko government program had given them. For this, the Communist Party needed political partners, so the existence of a social democratic party with a distinct left wing was extremely advantageous for it. So-called unity was therefore to be promoted in social organizations such as trade unions, youth movements, physical educations or cooperatives, but the previously agreed party system was to be maintained. The fact that Gottwald's leadership had a clearly thought out parliamentary plan is evidenced by the rapid formation of the organizational structure of the new Communist Party. I think it is agreed that this, is, this situation, where soon there was a party organization in practically every village, played an important role in the parliamentary elections in May 1946. What was important was the control of key positions of power, whether it was the Ministry of the Interior directly or the so-called security agenda, which fell under the national committees. Equally important was the general mood of society and its wartime experience. It reinforced the belief in a just social order and at the same time the desire to achieve it. 
communist propaganda was also able to work with this element as evidenced by the pre-election brochure called My Relationship to the Communist Party. The results of a controlled survey aimed at the so-called working intelligentsia. One of the teams that received a strong response was that of scientific socialism. In the answer, in the answers, it was conceived in various ways, but always as a promise of a controlled modern path to a happy future. While the responses of left-wing intellectuals from the time of the First Republic were more restrained, pointing out dangers of dogmatism, or that scientific socialism did not mean only dialectical socialism, the poet Ivan Blatny, for example, took up the subject with vigor of an enthusiastic youth. I quote, if scientific socialism gave the word Lenin during the Russian Revolution, whereas moderate and scientifically unsubstantiated socialism gave the word a figure as embarrassing as Kerensky, in the end necessarily a counter-revolutionary, it is a symbol beyond measure. So I will end my presentation here because I couldn't launch, unfortunately, my PowerPoint presentation. Thank you for your presentation. And I would give the floor to Mr. Kmeć. Robert Kmeć uh, is our next presenter. He's an independent researcher at the Institute of Political Science of the Slovak Academy of Sciences. He's mainly engaged in political history after 1945. He's the author of the monograph, The Status of Churches in Slovakia. And his presentation is about political judicial repression as a form of consolidating the communist power between 1948 and 1989. Thank you very much and greetings to Prague. Every non-democratic regime applies various political interventions to maintain power that prevent the population from expressing their opposing views. Political discrimination refers to any unjustified restriction on an individual's political freedom, which is unfounded and which is applied only to prove that he or she is an enemy of the state and the political system. In this way, the ruling communist power intimidated its real or perceived enemies and created, among other things, an atmosphere of fear in society. Through the repressions it carried out, the Communist Party of Czechoslovakia consolidated the absolute power it had acquired in the state. Political and judicial trials are an integral part of the communist regime. They began to be prepared even before for the 25th of February 1948, and the last ones were still underway in November 1989. The violence perpetrated took various forms, whether judicial or extrajudicial, that is administrative in nature. The security organs, primarily the state security service, have always played the most important role together with communist party officials and representatives of the political and judicial authorities. The latent tensions in society were constantly present and the outbreak of open dissent could only be prevented by force on the part of the state authorities. Forms of resistance, but also of revolt, were varied, often spontaneous and unorganized. People used them to express their disagreement with the policies pursued by the regime. The political, social, economic and situation in the state deteriorated, especially in the 1950s, with the result that the regime constantly sought out and created more of its so-called external and internal enemies. There was no social class in Czechoslovakia that was not affected by political repression. Hundreds of thousands of people were variously prescribed in Czechoslovakia, taking into account not only the direct victims, but also their relatives. The manifestations of dissent took various forms and were also used by the security authorities. 
they created or infiltrated various groups of opponents, subsequently arrested them, and the judicial authorities eventually convicted them of anti-state activities. It was not only in the early 1950s that the Communist Party openly sought enemies among its party members and in the security apparatus. It should be remembered, however, that many of them were directly involved in the repressions of the time, but in the end, they too became victims of the communist system they had helped to create. In the political judicial trials, individuals and groups were proven to be hostile to the communist regime and to have collaborated with the imperialists, with the Titoists, the Vatican, etc. This therefore includes all persons who have been accused of anti-state criminal activities to which they had to confess, usually with the use of violence. According to the data summarized on the basis of Act number 119-1990 on judicial rehabilitation, 255,399 persons were rehabilitated in Czechoslovakia, of whom 61,000 in Slovakia and 193,000 in the Czech lands. It's important to mention also those persons who died during the investigation or who were eventually released from pre-trial detention. There are also cases where some people were detained and convicted in the early 1950s and in the second half of the 1950s and early 1960s, respectively. Such cases also happened in the 70s and 80s. Other persons were assigned to forced labor camps, labor technical battalions, and otherwise administratively proscribed by the lower branches of communist power. This included those who refused to join the United Peasant Cooperatives, did not agree to the liquidation of trades, or were forcibly evicted as part of Action B, etc. The above figure is mostly indicative of the innocent victims of the communist regime. The total number of victims is disputed, but as historian Francois Mayer, for example, has pointed out, this does not help to identify communist and non-communist victims. While we need not regard these figures as including all those wrongly convicted, it's also important that they demonstrate the extent of the repression and its forms. They also included the economic impact, not only on individuals, but also on entire families. The final sentence usually included, in addition to the main punishment, ancillary penalties, namely financial punishment and the loss of honorary civil rights. After the sentence had been served or after release on amnesty, a further phase of discrimination against the person concerned began. For example, there was no possibility for him or her to be adequately employed or to obtain proper social security. The security authorities continued to monitor them. It's not possible to enumerate all forms of indirect reprisals. There were also prosecutions on ethnic and class grounds. The regime used various administrative, psychological and judicial persecutions to achieve political stabilization of the situation. In the literature, we often encounter the term political trials. However, the term political judicial trials is more accurate because it clearly indicates what kind of repression was used by the representatives of the communist regime to liquidate their real, but more often perceived enemies. The historian Josef Jablonicki has written about staged political trials. The phrase illegal or staged political trials is also often used. No matter what label is attached to them, it's clear that they were conducted against a person wrongly accused, investigated and eventually convicted for acts he or she did not commit and was obliged to serve a prison sentence in jail. Political trials and other forms of discrimination on political grounds represent one of the most most appalling chapters in the history of any country belonging to the former Soviet bloc. 
is characteristic of such trials that they convict a person on the basis of coerced and fabricated confessions using physical and psychological violence. It was not the courts and the prosecutor's office, but the security and party authorities who decided on the guilt and the amount of punishment for such a person who had no means of refuting the accusations, even though he or she formally had an appointed defense counsel. The investigative and judicial authorities strictly followed the well-known statement by Andrei Yanorievich Vyshinsky, a Soviet lawyer, that the most important thing is the confession of the accused. The application of Soviet investigative practices proved, as Josef Juraj, an evangelical pastor, resistance fighter and political prisoner stated in a letter to Alexander Dubček, first secretary of the Central Committee of the Communist Party of Czechoslovakia, dated uh, 20 February 1968, that the principle valid in the civilized world, that is, I quote, when someone accuses a person of something, they must first of all prove it, substantiate it with facts, has been rejected in Czechoslovakia. This principle, without which human society ceases to be human, was in my case violated in its essence. After all, the confession of the accused was intended to prove the correctness of the decision of the party authorities. It's common knowledge that the surviving interrogation protocols must be treated with the utmost critical scrutiny. They usually contain only what is relevant to the accusation of the interrogated according to the political template of the moment of the of interrogators. According to historian Bartoszek, the result of a diabolical game in whose vocabulary the ideological and political cliches of the executioner prevail. After 1953, the investigative practices and methods of drawing up protocols of interrogations of the accused began to change. That is, their brutality was partially mitigated. One surviving protocol of the 1954 uh, interrogation of Ivan Derer, a nationalist, first republic politician and resistance fighter, records his statement, I quote, that I am not obliged to incriminate myself. In that letter, Juraj recalled that in 1962, the investigator had been sympathetic to his situation, but only until he realized, I quote, that he was also an investigating authority and had to carry out orders. He lost his logic, his psychological abilities deserted him, and he believed everything that suited him and disbelieved nothing that testified in my favor, end of quote. The co-prisoners cooperating with the investigating authorities, that is the confidants, had their share in such confessions. In the relationship between the investigating authority and the person under investigation, there was also a contradiction between different facts. Milan Šimečka, a philosopher, described that the security authorities imposed another reality on him, which was incompatible with his own. The confession of the accused was considered the most important evidence, not only in the 50s and 60s, but also in the early 70s. On the basis of such a confession, Milan Hubel, a historian, was sentenced to six and a half years in prison in 1972. He testified that he was the editor-in-chief of the Semizdat Fakta Připomínky Události. Neither the investigator nor the courts had any other evidence. According to Bartoszek, Hubel's aim was probably to cover for the real editor-in-chief, whom he knew, and perhaps he was testing the role of the confession in the 1970s. The investigating authority demanded obvious lies from the accused only in order to fulfill the order and so that the identified victim could be convicted. Ladislav Holdosh, communist, interrogatist, resistance fighter and political prisoner in this context told Martoshek clearly, I quote, the fascist torturer wanted to tear the truth out of you, whereas our torturer wanted to tear the lie out of you. During the communist regime in Czechoslovakia, there were several waves of political judicial trials. 
The first began before 25th February 1948 and lasted until 1954. Historian Karel Kaplan named the first stage of the first wave as pre-February legacy. The political trial processes that la the political trials that lasted until the summer of 1948 are also characterized by political struggle that is the attempt to take control of society as quickly and completely as possible and thus to eliminate representatives of other political parties whom the communists considered dangerous the struggle among the leading communists to strengthen their own positions in power continued all political trials, not only those against communists, had the obvious aim of maintaining their hold on power, as was confirmed in the mid-1950s by members of the Communist Party Central Committee, refusing any rehabilitation of those tried on political grounds. This was repeated during the normalization period. The period from the summer of 1948 to the end of 1949 can be described as the second stage of the first wave of political judicial trials. From October 1949, however, Soviet advisors began to act directly on the investigations conducted by the STB. The monster trials, or the third stage of their first wave, began in 1950 and lasted until approximately the end of 1952. They involved the organized public. Resolutions were sent out demanding severe sentencing of those on trial. The fourth stage of the first wave took place between 1953 and 54. The political judicial trials continued in 1955 and 56, but at the same time, some of the sentences handed down in the previous period, especially those of the communists, began to be reviewed. The Barak Commission was set up in January 1955 for this purpose. It was confirmed that there was no political will to change the court decisions in question. The party leadership refused to take any responsibility for the political judicial trials. Kaplan stated that I quote, the review of political trials carried out between 1955 and 57 was in fact a second round of illegal verdicts. The year 1956 is characterized by a slight political and social loosening. The suppression of the revolution in Hungary was followed by a second wave of political judicial trials, which took place between 1957 and 1962. As I have already mentioned, it included convictions of persons who had already been in prison and serving sentences during the first wave of political judicial trials. On the one hand, the regime leaders released from prison on the basis of an amnesty those who had been convicted in the first wave of trials, and on the other hand, they again imprisoned others without reason. For those detained in the early 1960s, their charges were formulated in such a way that the amnesties of 1960 and 1962 did not apply to them. Thanks to the gradual easing of political and social conditions that took place from 1963 onwards, the number of political judicial trials decreased. At the same time, it should be recalled that Jan Benesch, a writer, was sentenced to five years imprisonment in 1967. The last political prisoners were released in early May 1968, after the invasion of Czechoslovakia by the Warsaw Pact troops and the changes in the highest party body, fear of further political and judicial trials grew in society. The normalization political judicial trials can also be divided into two stages. The first between 1969 and 1977, and the second between 1977 and 1989. The aim of the political judicial trials was to eliminate a possible power opponent, to ensure that there was no resistance to the ruling political power among the members of the Communist Party and the population. The intensity of the repression also depended on whether the regime was in its consolidation or relaxation phase. Indeed, many of the political judicial trials have not yet been uh, researched. Most attention has focused on the first wave 
1948-1954, as it was during this period that most innocent people were investigated and convicted, and the brutality of the interrogation practices of the time reached its peak. Although the methods of investigation changed to some extent between the 1950s and the end of the 1980s, the fact remains that political crimes were constantly committed by the party, security and judicial authorities. Until November 1989, there was an internal war waged by the ruling communist group against the citizens, as Jan Mlinarik, historian, dissident and political prisoner wrote. The historian Petr Blasek reminds us that this can be understood as a form of civil war. Thank you for your attention. Uh, thank you, Rokmeć, for your presentation. And our next speaker is Marian Loži. Marian uh, works in our institute and he is Mm. He focuses on studies of the communist well, uh, party, especially yeah. the person of Clement Gottwald and history of the post-1948 period. His presentation focuses on some regional um, aspects after 1948 the communist party was looking for enemies in its own rows and marianne studies what was the impact of that in the lower ranks of the communist party marianne the floor is yours uh, thank you libor i will just launch my presentation now I hope you can see it. I will just get back to the beginning. So my presentation is titled Searching for Enemies in the Regional Leadership of the Communist Party of Czechoslovakia. I'm speaking here of years 1950 to 1951. And to be more precise, we start in autumn 1950 and the events around Otto Schling and then going on to spring 1951. The question I'm asking myself is to what extent of the search for enemies in regional structures was um, organized from above and or to what extent it was actually an individual activity. This terror or purges um, were using Stalinist dictionary. It's a dynamic vocabulary, so it was different in the 1950s to 1970s. Uh, the notions used were very binary, very black and white. You use strong words such as agent or enemy in the Stalinist period. And each of the leading secretaries get some negative attribute. A specific role plays the term dictator, which is defined locally solely. It applies to regional Stalinist elites. We may speak of secretaries of regional committees, members of the presidium of regional committees, etc. And it was reserved for regional uh, level, not for lower ranks. It is important to know, too, that this pressure was co-created from below in, in the regions. Uh, 
even and it was used even before the term dictator was used in in resolutions so we have here other actors and it also proves that the word dictator was widely used often uh, secretaries of committees were the most frequent victims of these accusations. I will not offer here an exhaustive definition of who were the regional um, secretaries and how the regional structure functioned. Uh, the definitions may sometimes seem contradictory, but they do not exclude one another, I believe, but complement one another. We can see these people as true dictators. Often they were brought from above. They came from the center to the regions and of course they surrounded themselves with their people and within the regional apparatus they weren't um, playing an important role another important aspect is that they are terrorized the subordinates and also the society uh, be it um, the process of collectivization, of request to fulfill the five-year plan, etc. They, except for being dictators, were also demagogues. They wanted to be in favor of the party's apparatus, so they would circumvene established structures and which appealed uh, to party members so in fact mobilizing from below which can then lead to tyranny or demagogues and thirdly they were dictators but to some extent by coercion they were resorting to brutal practices as a way out of distress at that time, the party still didn't have a functional bureaucratic structure and they had to achieve the radical political and economic goals of Stalinism. They needed to form the heavy industry network, etc. So they were functioning within the structure of the Communist Party that motivated them to act in certain way. The Communist Party at the time was a complex or even chaotic organism. When we speak of its structures, I will offer you partial definitions. And when I speak of party members, I use a very broad term. Uh, cadres are local regional leaders who are legitimate but their legitimacy stops when the secretaries come from above we could say that party members were shaped from top to bottom by democratic centralism, that there was strong discipline, very rigid hierarchy, making party members obedient instruments in the hands of leaders. Next, we could also say that the party finds itself in a phase of, of development not quite long ago. It had tens of uh, thousands of members and now it has millions. Most of them um, joined the party in 1945 and later on. As late as 1948, the party uh, took total control over the system, over the society, agriculture, culture, uh, 
etc. So it was a fresh monopoly and the party had to adjust its mechanisms to fulfill this function. And it also tries to reach its fantastic goals. So in a way it is limited as to what it can expect and demand from the party members meaning that they are uncontrollable and to some extent autonomous on a personal or even regional level. So some partisans of the party were active at the behest of the leadership to, they were willing to speak out at the meetings or even to criticize, but they would only criticize in certain areas and using uh, defined terms, specific uh, vocabulary. Mm. This can be observed in the search for the enemy in the regional communist party. Here we speak again of a specific uh, period, 1950 to 1951. So the search for enemies took place, especially at the regional level. Looking for enemies within the structure was defined on the local level. We can say it was looking for enemies or we can even use the word terror or purges. As part of the process there happened an intersection of all the phenomena as described before. That is Stalinism, the regional elite, the party. To lead this radical search for enemies uh, was made possible by existing conditions. And this was these conditions existed for a long time and were accelerated by the arrest of Otto Schling, the leading secretary of the regional committee of the Czechoslovak Communist Party in Brno. If we look at the regional level, so I might mention that since 1949, there were 19 regions in, in Czechoslovakia and the party organization functioned in the same way. The structure adapted to the party uh, structure, but it went actually both ways. So I used here a map of the statistical office and previously there were only six regions which were bigger and perhaps I should mention that Prague and the central Bohemia region functioned as one unit. For my research, I chose seven regions, Bratislava, Ustí nad Labem, Pardubice, Karlovy Vary, Pilsen, Olomouc and Prešov. So I did have to make some choices as to the selection of the regions and I chose by uh, interesting events happening in these in these regions. Um, these are regions with the party structure, secretaries, party members, etc. I used chart from Yiri Munyak, which Maniak, sorry, which shows the number of members as of September 1st, 1950. So if you look at Praha or Preshov, the difference is huge. Preshov was a small organization within the Communist Party. And you can see that Prague had double the number of uh, party members than all of Slovakia. Here are names of some of the active members on the left, you can 
see the uh, central figures, those who were looking actively for the enemies. And on the right side, you see the Stalinist elite that was uh, in the regions. So sometimes these were uh, deputy secretaries or uh, leading secretaries of the regional committees. Um, I cannot offer you a synopsis of, of the events in all these regions. So I will just focus on certain elements where we can observe some similarities or differences. Of course, there is more attention given to Prague, Brno or Ostrava than uh, to Pardubice or Preshov. Of always the key uh, areas will be given more attention. But there was some minimum program uh, related to the region. So there always had to be someone chosen um, as enemy. And sometimes you could point out at a secretary and say that he's a dictator, remove him and stop the inquisition. But if more people would join the regional secretary or the so-called dictator saying that he was criticized or persecuted, then the more hunt there will be, the greater event it would become. It really depended on the reaction of the other members, functionaries, local functionaries, and their level of uh, activity. In Pilsen or in Pardubice, they were very active in other places, such as in Usti, in Adlabem. It ended in January 1951, and the events wouldn't uh, continue. Also varying degrees of participation of the so-called subaltern cadres was related to it. And this is often in places such as Preshov, where they use the search for enemies to use it for solving their local conflicts, their personal conflicts and use the um, broader uh, events to cover it. There were also specific cases of defense of regional dictators. This was, for instance, the case of Karlo Vivari and of Olomouc, where in March 1951, Čepička, the Minister of Defense, arrived to criticize the Secretary František Řezníček of Olomouc, saying that the mistakes are his fault, etc. And uh, participants of the plenum, instead of joining the critique, actually defended Zhezniček, saying that he works well, and if there were any mistakes, then those were from, um, from the center. Before concluding, I may give partial responses. We could divide terror to rational and irrational. So it certainly is rational terror because the headquarters sought regional legitimacy. They adapted and adapted its actions to the responses from below. If there were no responses, then it went away very fast. 
So that's the rational aspect. And the irrational one is that often it's an over dynamic. Mm, it's over dynamic events. Often people who wouldn't expect it uh, were eventually criticized. And it wasn't always clear about who will be the victim and who will be the accusator. Mm. I have a hypothesis uh, explaining the search of the enemy in the region, and I call the living democratic um, legacy. It was quite passive in uh, border regions that were evacuated and in Slovakia. Here, the party activity wasn't very strong. So it can lead us to asking a questions whether the previous historical experience also explains things. So Stalinism is not just a temporary parenthesis in the Czech history and its development, but actually links to the previous experience, to the behavior in, in the past, proving that Stalinism is part of Czechoslovak history of the 20th century. I would end my presentation here. Thank you. Thank you, Marianne. Before inviting our other speaker, I would like to thank all of you who are listening and watching, and thank you also for your questions. You are still welcome to send us your question if you want them answered. Our next speaker is Jaroslav Rokovsky from uh, University of Jan Evangelista Burkine in Ustí nad Labem. He also works at the research department of the Institute Research Department for the years 38 to 89, the Institute for the Study of Totalitarian Regimes in Prague. His research focuses on the history of Czechoslovakia, especially the period of the First Republic and the history of the Agrarian Party and the, the resistance against Nazism and Communism and the persecution of political prisoners. His presentation is about the members of the Communist Party of Czechoslovakia before May 1945 and their imprisonment for political and criminal crimes in the 1950s in Czechoslovakia. Thank you. The communist regime in Czechoslovakia imprisoned its political opponents, real and perceived, throughout ex existence, with the exception of a few months in the 1960s. It also imprisoned members of its own party who opposed it, whether truly or allegedly as part of the sharpening of the class struggle and the search for enemies within its own communist ranks. I quote, an individual, however highly placed, can fail, can betray, but the party comrades will never betray. End of quote. These are the words of Clement Gottwald after the trial of Rudolf Stlansky at the National Conference of the Communist Party the Soviet Union in December 1952. For the forged communists, not only in Gottwald's Czechoslovakia, the following was true. The party is everything, the party is never wrong. The Minister of National Security, Karol Bacilek, then added to his party leader, I quote, the party with the help of the national security organs will decide who is guilty and who is innocent where mistakes and errors end and criminal responsibility begins, end of quote. Communists arrived in large numbers in the Czechoslovak prison facilities during the years 1953 to 1954. 
where they met non-communists of various shades, that is, political prisoners whom they had previously helped to send there. They also met retributive prisoners and criminal prisoners, from thieves to murderers. No doubt, these were bitter times for them. Among them were communist notables imprisoned after the fall of Slansky, who escaped the news. In May 1954, for example, former deputy foreign ministers Artur London and Favro Haidu, poet and politician Ladislav Novomesky, ambassador Richard Slansky, brother of the executed Rudolf Slansky, military prosecutor Andon Rashla and Germanist and diplomat Eduard Goldstücker uh, were in the Leopoldov prison. The latter joined the Communist Party of Czechoslovakia in 1936, only to be arrested in December 1951 after his dismissal as ambassador to Israel and sentenced to hard labor for life in May 1953. Some of them did not stay behind bars for long. Eduard Goldstücker, for example, was released on the 23rd of December 1955, returning home from the Rovnost camp in the Yachimov region. However, every day in prison at this time was really hard, sometimes cruel, even for them. Illegally convinced communists were therefore released or had their sentences commuted but were not rehabilitated. The Barak Commission, the Inquiry Commission set up by the Central Committee of the Communist Party of Czechoslovakia and worked under its direct supervision, submitted its final report in October 1957. This was one of the many absurdities of the 1950s in Czechoslovakia. On behalf of the Ministry of the Interior and in part the Ministry of Justice, it included former trial actors, investigators and judges. Those who had deliberately staged the trials were now investigating them, all under the baton of the party leadership, which knew from the very beginning and bore the main responsibility for them. It was purely and simply a rehabilitation game involving a small number of communists. At the end of the 1950s, the Novotny regime was faced with a dilemma. What attitude to take towards the still imprisoned communists who had been members of the party before May 1945? A draft of the forthcoming amnesty stated that they could be released whether they had committed anti-state crimes, collaborationism, or certain more serious criminal offenses. These included 21 persons convicted of anti-state crimes and 16 persons convicted of criminal offenses. It should have been consistently stated in the supporting materials that they were former members of the Communist Party. In the final stage, the decision to release 17 communists was finally taken, among other things, because 27 of the convicted persons claimed to have been members of the party before May 1945, but after checking the records of the Communist Party Central Committee, it was found that this was not true. I will mention which specific communists were in question, whether or not they would be released, what their party record was, when and for what they were imprisoned, to what punishment and what their behavior and health was like in the communist dungeons in the late 1950s. I would divide them into five groups and I will say for reasons of time, at least a few words about each of them with more space in the subsequent discussion. The first one is Slansky's group that means it consisted of the communists from the trial of the so-called anti-state conspiracy center headed by Rudolf Slansky, and then from the trial of Maria Shvermova and former regional secretaries. At the end of the 1950s, only Evgen Label was left in prison from the Slansky trial, 
He was 52 years old and had been a party member since 1931, although he himself stated that he had only joined the party in 1934. During his sentence, his behavior was judged to be above reproach. At the beginning of March 1960, when he was still in the prison in Bozenbore, the amnesty was not supposed to apply to him, but finally he passed through the prison gates on the 10th of May 1960. Another case was Andrei Kabos, a member of the party since 1932, who until 1950 was the leading regional secretary of the CPSU in Bratislava. He was sentenced to 15 years imprisonment. During his sentence, he had a decent and disciplined behavior. Also, his work ethic was good. He was 48 years old and the amnesty applied to him. A similar case was Erwin Polak, five years older. We saw his name in one of the previous presentations. He came from a peasant family in the terminology of the times, from a family of a village rich man. In 1950, uh, sorry, uh, 25, he joined the Communist Party of Czechoslovakia and spent the war in England, where he became a member of the party leadership. After May 1945, he held various positions in the Ministry of the Interior, and from 1950 until his arrest, he was the chief secretary of the Communist Party of Czechoslovakia. He was sentenced to 15 years of hard labor. His behavior in prison was good, his health satisfactory, and he was released from Leopold prison on amnesty in May 1960. I quote, ignorance of the harmfulness and criminality of my actions, end of quote. This is how Mikuláš Landa responded in prison when asked what motivated his criminal activity. We could also see Mikuláš Landa's name in uh, my colleague's chart, Mr. Loji. Uh, the Budapest native came from a family of small businessmen. He had been a member of the Communist Party since 1936. During the occupation, he emigrated to England, where he was a member of the Communist Party leadership. After May 1945, he worked first as editor of Rude Bravo. From 1946, he worked in the Secretariat of the Communist Party Central Committee, and from 1950, as regional secretary in Ustina Labem. His sentence was reduced from the original 20 years to five years after the retrial. His behavior during his sentence was assessed as good as was his state of health. The amnesty applied to him and he was able to leave the prison in Leopoldov. The only woman was Yarmila Tausikova Potuchkova, a former confidant of Rudolf Slansky, who was 45 years old. She had been a member of the Communist Party since 1932. During the occupation, she joined the resistance. Her husband, the communist František Tausik, was executed by the Nazis, and she was imprisoned in the Ravensbrück concentration camp until the end of the war. After May 1945, she was employed at the Communist Party of Czechoslovakia Central Committee and was elected a member of the KSC Central Committee at the 8th Congress of the party, where she then held various positions on behalf of the party up to a key position in the so-called Party Control Commission. Before her arrest, she married a doctor, Potuček, and had a son, Martin. She was sentenced to 20 years imprisonment. During her sentence, which was mostly spent in the women's prison in Pardubice, she had good behavior and worked well. The amnesty was initially not supposed to apply to her, but she was eventually released in May 1960. The second group were criminal offenses. One of the partisan commanders from the Slovak National Uprising, who ended up on the gallows after February 1948, was Josef Trojan. Two rank and file communists, Pavel Glenda and Josef Kocnar, were also in Trojan's group, which was labeled a criminal gang after the fall of Slansky. Both joined the party in 1942 and both survived the fighting in the Slovak mountains. The crime was murder. After liberation, they were to join the so-called militia, which was to carry out the liquidation of persons inconvenient to Trojan. The militia was to become the scourge of all honest citizens in a short time. 
Glenda was directly involved in the murder of five people, as was Kotzner, who shot at least two of them in the back of the head. The verdict was handed down by the Supreme Court in October 1953. Glenda was sentenced to 12, year, 12 years imprisonment, Kotzner to 16 years. This crime actually happened and at the very end of the war. There were five murders in Batovane and the victims were exhumed from shallow graves during the Third Republic. Trojan has always denied that he knew about the murders or even ordered them. In asking for a review of the trial, the convicts pointed out that the statements were coerced. They also defended themselves by saying that those shot at the end of the war were fascists. Glenda and Kutzner's conduct in prison was disciplined and their health was good. At the end of the 1950s, they were both in the Yachimov prison and the amnesty was not supposed to apply to them. The third group were economic offenses, sabotage. He pushed through the harmful construction of a heavy forge at Huko failed to ensure the timely operation of the power plant and caused the delay in the production of the Škoda Sedan 1000. This was the criminal act of Jan Barta. Born in Ma, Hungary, he came from a family of tradesmen and had been a member of the Communist Party since 1932. He was sentenced to 25 years of hard labor, later commuted to 12 years imprisonment. He served his sentence in the Pilsen Bore prison. His behavior during his sentence was undisciplined, but his work ethic was good, as was his health. The amnesty should not have applied to him. Another case was Jaroslav Pribel, who was a member of the KSC since 1926. During the First Republic, he worked in the party press. Among other things, he was a member of the management of the publishing house of Rude Bravo. After May 1945, he returned there and held a number of positions as the commissioner of the Gas Chess Center Committee. In 1947, he moved to the chemical industry. The criminal offense was theft of national property and illegal arming. He was sentenced to 16 years and eight months. During his sentence, he had a good behavior and worked well. At the end of the 1950s, he stayed in Plzeň Bore prison and the amnesty was not supposed to apply to him either. Another communist was Jan Bobček, who came from a peasant family and joined the Communist Party in 1936, the Communist Party of Slovakia. During the Slovak national uprising, he worked as a liaison for the Partisan Brigade Chapayev. From 1946, he held the post of secretary of the regional committee of the Communist Party of Slovakia in Nitra. The criminal offense was theft of national property. As the head of the local economy department of the Nitra Council of the MNV, he and others concluded incorrect contracts for personal enrichment from autumn 1956 to February 1957. The damage caused was around 250,000 crowns. He was sentenced to five years imprisonment. The criminal proceedings in the Court of Appeal were adjourned. 47-year-old Bobchik was in the Vikman of Fremont prison. Another case was Ignaz Hazucha, who came from a family of tradesmen and from 1944 lived in the Soviet Union, where he joined the Communist Party of the Soviet Union and was transferred to the KSC in 1946. During the war, he took part in combat as a paratrooper and was awarded several Czechoslovak and Soviet medals for his bravery. He was sentenced to 12 years imprisonment for treason. His sentence was subsequently reduced by four years by amnesty of the President of the Republic. In November 55, he escaped from prison and was one of the prisoners who escaped through the tunnel from the Nikolai camp in the Yachimov region. And there were moral offenses for reasons of time, but also for ethical reasons. I will limit myself to stating that there were a total of three communists and the crime was sexual abuse. 
The fifth group, Slovak bourgeois nationalists. For Novotny's leadership in the late 50s, this was the most sensitive issue. In the spring 1954, prominent Slovak communists who had been instrumental in establishing the communist regime in Slovakia were condemned for their nationalist policies that weakened the state. At the end of the 50s, Theodor Balaš, a party member since 1943, was still in prison, having worked at the state security headquarters in Bratislava after the war. He was sentenced to 25 years of hard labor for the alleged offense, treason, and his sentence was subsequently commuted to 16 years. He served his sentence in Leopoldov. And the same was the case with Oskar Valašek, a party member since 1942, when he was granted membership for his illegal activities for the Communist Party of Slovakia in Ružom Berok. After the war, he worked at the Central Committee of the Communist Party of Slovakia, first as a cadre officer and then as a security officer in Bratislava. His sabotage consisted in promoting bourgeois nationalists of the same origin to senior positions in the security service. He was supposed to promote a cadre policy in which security posts were also filled by former gendarmes and he neglected working class cadres. In addition, he was to hide material from the Raika trial. The sentence was 17 years imprisonment. He also served his sentence in Leopold prison. And the last one is Gustav, Gustav Husak. And that would be a long story. Maybe we will have time in the discussion. Uh, at the time of the May amnesty, he was 47 years old. He had been a member of the party since 1933. His criminal offense was treason. As the leader of a bourgeois nationalist group, he was supposed to have interfered in the leadership of the Slovak national uprising and hindered the struggle for liberation. After 1945, he was to sabotage the implementation of the Košice government program in Slovakia. He was sentenced to life imprisonment, later commuted to 25 years. End of sentence, 6 February 1976. During his sentence, Husak behaved in a decent and disciplined manner. His work record was good, his health was good, and he was physically and mentally healthy. He was serving his sentence at the time in Mirov. Prison. The amnesty was not initially intended to apply to him. Antonín Novotný was aware of the difficulties that would await him with Husak, but he could not prevent it, even though he had the last word on these persons concerning amnesty. He used a red pencil to tick off who would go home. In the end, although he did not want to, he also made a mark on Gustav Husak, who was then released. To conclude, I would say that the communist regime in Czechoslovakia decided to declare the largest amnesty in its history. 5,601 political prisoners, that is 64% of the total number, left prison gates. The large-scale amnesty of the 9th of May 1960 mostly included imprisoned communists who had been party members before May 1945. What can we say about them in conclusion? Victims of the system they helped create. The prison years were a severe disillusionment for them, but they overwhelmingly kept their faith in the party. The Communist Party of Czechoslovakia felt strong as never before. Its leadership role was enshrined in the Constitution of July the 11th, 1960, and communism was about to embark in the age of the atom, rockets and satellites on a victorious path throughout the world. Ladies and gentlemen, thank you for your attention and I apologize for not respecting the time limit. I was expecting that, so thank you very much for your presentation. Uh, uh, last speaker of this panel is our colleague Jaroslav Tsuhra from the Institute of Contemporary History, who also teaches at Faculty of Arts of Charles University. Well, I don't. He, so, I'm sorry, he was teaching. Jaroslav Tsuhra is author of a number of works of books 
And in his presentation, uh, Yaroslav invites us to participate in his uh, view of promoting the scientific worldview and atheism. Good morning to, to you all. Actually, I don't need to say anything because I was supposed to finish at 11.15 and it's already 11.20, so. But I will try anyway. In the recent years, I've been dealing with the process of atheization, of suppression of, of religion. As a society, we are aware of the political processes of imprisonments, etc. But in fact, the idea was to revert completely the man, to take away the religion from him and then install a new morale, communist morale. One of the commissions mentions that the question of religion and of suppression of religion is very closely linked with the creation of the communist man. Communist party is formally a Christian party. In 1950, only half a million people declare to be atheists without faith. That means that formally speaking, the Communist Party has huge amount of members who um, declared to be religious in the 1950. Of course, it's just a formality, but when the population's count was made in 1950, this is what they declared. Some people, I mean, most people didn't see it as problematic to be part of a church and member of the Communist Party, which is very important to know. The Communist Party and its top ranks worked very carefully with the issue of religion. They were slowly creating this image of class enemy in Vatican or in Germany, etc. But a number of things were still allowed. In 1950, there was the Cyrilus and Methodius um, gathering. Uh, there were efforts made to bring priests, to bring people. That would be totally impossible to imagine in the 1980s. But back then, the party supports these traditions still. Then, in 1952, uh, comes a major change when Kopetsky, one of the radicals, anti-Christian radicals, spoke during the founding of the Czechoslovak Society for the Dissemination of Political and Scientific Knowledge. And he speaks of people who are simple people and they are religious because they don't know better. And he sees them as actually preventing uh, development and eventually becoming enemies of the society and of the class. And he wants to 
um, get rid of that. So this is a major shift, a major change. Um, the Protestants heard for the first time then that um, this will not be a joint path, but that there will be measures taken against the Christians. Kopetsky's speech is not a coincidence. In the months that follow, uh, bring changes in the education of religion, which was until then obligatory in schools. From now on, it becomes something you have to apply for. You have to have a written approval of both parents that their child will attend religion classes and it's done through schools. So you have to raise your hand publicly. I don't have time to explain all the connotations uh, this entailed, but it was a major blow. So I could quote a report from a small village of Domanin saying that comrades are believers and they wish to have religion taught in schools. Teachers don't teach anything, but in religious classes, children at least get some moral pillars. This is a radical shift. Until now, religion, faith were not attacked. Now, there is scientific opinion, worldview, new policies that are replacing the religion. There are new um, rituals such as welcoming the new citizens, the etc. The religious rituals are being replaced by civic um, rituals such as again welcoming uh, the newborns, taking boys to the army, cremating the deceased, etc. So in the second half of the 1950s, um, there are extracurriculum activities that are to take places at the same time as the church service or religious gatherings, etc. At the same time, appears the opinion that teachers cannot be uh, religious and there are attacks on teachers. Those who are church members are fired as I could state here an example of Mr. Prochaska who was fired due to his beliefs. So instead of being a high school teacher, he became a manual worker operating a crane. There were efforts to reduce the number of children attending religion classes. And I have some beautiful examples. For instance, in Brno, a director went to hide it, to hide when applications for religious classes were to be filed so they couldn't in other towns they didn't even propose a date and then they told the parents that they missed their deadline and it mm, 
was 400 children concerned. So this approach is very interesting. Until then, a direct attack on faith didn't exist. And now it was so obvious. It is related to Nikita Khrushchev's attacks on religion in, um, in Russia. He didn't only attack the corn, he also attacked the believers. The efforts continue. I cannot quote a document because it's my colleagues and he doesn't wish that I quote it, but I could quote from another document where a university student was fired um, because of attending a religious service. So the dean meet and the vice rector meet, and it, it's similar to burning Jan Hus at stake. It, it's similar congregations of officials who decide what will happen. So the leadership agreed that there is no reason to be nice about it. And they just take the right of the children to have religious education from them. It is an easy victory in general, but it also uh, disintegrates from within. Uh, in Prague, for instance, uh, church are removed, uh, their function of church is removed on the grounds of them attracting too many people. Sometimes because too many people gather to listen to the uh, music played in the churches, etc. So that also serves as a reason to um, desacralize uh, churches. When we get to the end of the 1960s, we realize that the ratio of participation of religious events is much reduced, but there, the success of creating a new man, the attempt of creating a new man was not successful. What they created was an indifferent man who doesn't care. Then comes 1968, and this is the year with a number of rehabilitation efforts, including dismissed teachers. There are protests against such rehabilitations. In 1968, an anti-party appeared saying that these people shouldn't be rehabilitated and that the party departs from the idea it was pushing forward still recently. It also states the right of the society to choose teachers. This is in 1968. Then follows the period of normalization. It's a very radical 
approach as also uh, illustrated by um, Vassil Bilak's uh, expression, for instance, a case of a kindergarten teacher who had her child baptized and was fired, etc. So it continues. Religious faith is a problem and it needs to be dealt with. In January 1973, the Presidium of the Central Committee was discussing some measures. Such as discussing the army service as an experience that creates great conditions for creating a new worldview and a demand to renew all sorts of traditions that will be not religious ones and would replace those uh, religious gatherings and meetings and services and so on. So in normalization, the efforts uh, to de-religionize uh, the society deepened, but it didn't offer much in returns, um, except some sort of, sort of uh, celebrations and parties. Uh, the party didn't offer much. Uh, the head of the communist university uh, proposed to have grades in religion. And to that came an answer that religion was not part of the education, but that if a child attends such classes, then of course it is part of the final report because attending religious classes testifies to the character of the pupil and his entire family. Some unhappy employee of Tesla Rozhnov wrote a question to Mlada Fronta daily asking about religious classes for his daughter and he said that he was told that if he sent his daughter to such a classes his daughter would then not be allowed to attend high school, to which came a reply from the Ministry of Education that their aim indeed was to create people with Marxist-Leninist worldviews, which doesn't go hand in hand with religion, and therefore it is preferred to have young people studying at high schools who are not religious. And another example from 1972 in Bishitsa, uh, response from the local communist organization commenting on, a, on studies of someone's child on high school, saying that since the family is religious, they do not recommend their child to study at a high school. I believe these examples are of extreme importance. And I would end with a last quote in 1982. There was a complaint filed from for being fired because of her daughter attending religious classes and the response was, Oh dear, 
you have things mixed up. You have to have things well ordered if you want your child to study. So it's much about education and early on there is a scientific atheist education introduced to schools and it's something that complements the picture of the fight against religion and it also complements the fact that in the documents of 1979 say the same things as documents in earlier years uh, saying that they didn't succeed to create a new man. To conclude, I would say that I believe this is not a dead issue. We still deal with the heritage of communism and the relation we have to faith. There are all sorts of weird stereotypes that we still have to deal with. And I'm running out of time, so I would like to thank you for your attention. Thank you very much. Uh, Mr. Zuhra for your presentation. And now let's move on to the Q&A. We have about 10 questions and we have to stop at quarter past 12. So we have 30 minutes. I'm going to read the questions. If the, the panelists have a question or a comment, just raise your hand on the camera and I will give you the floor. The first question is for Mr. Kokoshka. Adam Shumichrast is asking, I would like to ask, what impact did the fact that the unification slash merger of the Communist Party and Social Democracy in Slovakia already took place during the Slovak National Uprising in the autumn 44 have on the facts and developments you mentioned? Thank you. Please switch on your microphone. As for the developments in the Czech lands, I think there was no impact because it stemmed from the internal situation, from the idea that the worker class, working class should unite. The opinion was very strong still in 1946, as uh, shown by a survey on the number of political parties that was only in the Czech lands that the survey, survey was done. And most people declared that the number of political parties was sufficient. A small number of people said that there were not enough political parties, but in the salaried uh, respondents, which were the workers, many, most people found that the number of political parties was too high. I mentioned Clement Gottwald and his speech in Lucerna, where he said, we will not unite with social democracy now, but it will happen later. Social democracy was always um, disturbed by this, and it was the most pessimistic party before the elections in 46. The situation was different in the Central Committee of KSC, if we are to believe Clement Gottwald, in December 1945, the elections were being prepared and he said that they always knew that the system of two parties that was created in the Slovak National Uprising would soon become 
not functional, that the situation would polarize. It's interesting that it was about how to enlarge the number of parties in Slovakia. It was the idea to separate the social democrats into two parties. The Czech social democrats were trying to expand to Slovakia. And the communists were very strategic. They had their tactics. They were getting ready for different options to be able to react quickly. There was no conclusion, clear conclusion to the debate. They were discussing whether the politics should be based more on principles or on tactics. So my view is that in the Czech lands, as far as the efforts to merge the communists and the social democrats are concerned, this, this was part of the tactics created for the Czech lands. Thank you. Uh, and there is another question for you from Jakub Verba. Uh, who says, I would follow up Adam Schumichrast and ask about the role of the Slovak question in a broader way. After all, the Communist Party of Czechoslovakia, however formally divided with the Communist Party of Slovakia, was the only Czechoslovak party, also not a Czechoslovakist one. Yes, um, there was an asymmetry. There was the Slovak National Council, which did not exist in the Czech lands. Also, the rule was based on parity in exile. There was the elections and the other parties supported the parity. There were maneuvers on the part of the KSČ in Slovakia was supposed to have 50 MPs and the Social Democrats as well. In the Czech lands, the Slovak question was on the table quite quickly after the liberation. And the Czech National Council was to be transformed into the land committee it was already on the 5th of May, and the initiator was Josef Smerkovsky, who said the government is back, our task is accomplished, and now it will be transformed into the Land National Committee. They wanted to prevent the creation of a model from the bottom up. It was also mentioned that the same would happen in Slovakia, this transformation into the land national committee, which did not happen. There was a broader coalition that made pressure, this Czech National Council, on the part of not just the communists, but other government parties. And this was a reflection of the situation in Slovakia. It was what happened in Košice. So the Slovak question, of course, resonated in the Central Committee. It resonated in the government. But regarding the resistance, as it was established at the end of the war, it is the Czech National Council. It was, as I mentioned in my presentation, and this is typical for the whole protectorate period. The Slovak question was not a big issue in the Czech resistance. Thank you. 
Okay, next we have a question from Mr. Jiří Svatoš to Rok Meď. Are there any cases up to the mid-1950s where ex-officio defense lawyers actively tried to defend the politically persecuted, both in court and in pre-trial proceedings? Well, that's a specific issue. Usually, they, these lawyers were told what to do and what not to do. For sure, there, there were some isolated cases where the lawyers uh, tried to do something, but I, I'm not aware of any such case where the lawyer would really defend the, the person, the accused person. I don't know any case where the lawyer would really help. It was rather the contrary. Where the lawyer uh, was against the appeal against the sentence. Thank you. Jar, Jar wants to react. No. Okay. Another question. Two, quest two more questions for Norok Meď. One is from Jakub Verba, who is asking whether differences in repressions in the Czech lands and in Slovakia. That's a complex issue. Of course, the situation was not the same. And one example is the Catholic Church in the year 1949, the Catholic action. But it was not just about the Catholic Church, but also the Protestant Church, Pavoluhodskai, for example. He was the general bishop and they couldn't arrest him. So there are some differences. But the, the mechanism worked in the same way. There was no difference. The political judicial trials mostly ended at the Supreme Court in Prague. I can add that my experience is the same from my research. And then another question from Matej Bíli. You mentioned the term civil war. Do you personally lean towards the thesis that the initial phase of the Communist Party dictatorship can indeed be defined as a civil war? In your opinion, what are the arguments for and against? Yes, there was a discussion on this some years ago. On the one hand, there were two parties to the conflict, but they were not equal. One, one party in the conflict had all the power and the, the other side could only react to the measures directed towards them. This is a sensitive issue. The whole state apparatus used terror, methods of terror against the population in order to preserve their power. But it would be a long discussion about the civil war, whether it was a civil war. Thank you, Nero. Now we have two questions for Marianne Loji. The first one is from his superior, Matej Bíli. Regarding the thesis that in Slovakia, the members of the KSC committees were not so active. Was this really the case or could it be a certain gap in the sources? Do the records of the committees in the Czech lands and in Slovakia differ, Marianne? That's a great question, and I would not narrow this only to the members of the regional committees. You could also include members of other secretariats or committees. I tried to use 
different sources. Primarily, I worked with the National Archive. I was not able to compare the sources with Slovakia, but I also studied the archives of the Ministry of the Interior in the archives of the Security Corps. And it's true that there are differences in the sources. When I work with a certain sample, when I can't, can't find anything in the sources, it means it doesn't exist for me as a historian. But the sources differ. I can say that there was a tendency to bring everything to Prague from Slovakia. There's a difference in what is available to me in terms of sources for the Czech lands and for Slovakia. Thank you. Another question. Mr. Jakub Verba is asking, could you elaborate on the final thesis and the reasons for the differences between the active historically ethnically Czech areas and the borderlands in Slovakia? I'm wondering if you are thereby supporting or in some ways refuting the thesis that the political and class cleansing of the 1950s follows and in some ways builds on the post-war ethnic cleansing. No, this question has many layers. There are some things visible as early as in 48. There's a certain continuity. And we can see that some things were used again in borderlands uh, in order to evict Germans or to seize their property, their radios. So things were used again against the Germans who were still on the Czech territory. And then it's also reflected in 1950, 51 in the border regions. There was a tendency not so much from the center. The center wanted rather to accept the remaining Germans to reconcile, but other actors were against the fact that the Germans had the same rights, the same rewards, whereas they should be punished according to them. I cannot say to what extent this these statements are representative or isolated. As for the comparison between the Czech lands and Slovakia, I did not have an a priori thesis about the reflection of the democratic tradition. I was uh, comparing the regions, and some of them it was discussed and dealt with for a long time. Whereas in Bratislava, for example, at Vikulak, it was not reflected further. It was over quickly. In Slovakia, the impact was much smaller. Thank you, Marianne. And I have one more question for you from Mr. Pavel Fojtík. How do you explain that the Prague region was not affected by the purchase? According to your thesis, as the most numerous region, it should be the most active and therefore the greatest tension should occur there. That's a great question. And we mention Czech historic lands and not, not mention Prague. That's a specific case. Prague was the seat of the central bodies. So on the one hand, the purge was uh, the harshest. There was Rudolf Slansky. So of course, the attention was drawn 
to the center. That's one interpretation. And second, specificity of Prague. Antonin Novotny was criticized before 1950 to some extent, but in 1951, the direction changed completely and Prague was concerned with František Weiss, František Řezniček, who was in Prague before going to Olmouc, and they were the potential enemies. And at the time, there was already Marie Švermová, the Deputy General Secretary, and her role was much more important. So that's my explanation. Jan for mentioning it because that's exactly what I get in my research of the uh, security um, corpses. We then have a question by Radek Slabotinsky to Jaroslav Rokoski. How did former communists accept their release? Can you describe the fate of some of those who were released? Jaroslav, don't forget to switch on your mic. Thank you for your question. Well, most of the prominent communists considered a sort of half solved matter. They were released with a condition of a 10 year period so they could return to prison within those 10 years if the regime was to accuse them of something else. But they sought rehabilitation. They wanted to be rehabilitated in order to re become again members of the party and have functions. That's quite obvious in prominent communists. And it's of course a long struggle Gustav Husak, I think, succeeded in 1964, so it took him a good few years. He doesn't like the idea of being a, a half criminal. If you look at the Czech history of the 20th century, you'd see there are two men who lived uh, whose life was politics entirely, and it's Edvard Beneš and Gustav Husak. So it was unacceptable for him to, the idea of having to abandon uh, politics. Then in 1962, uh, there is Kolder's commission, then there is Barnabice commission, actually forced into existence by those communists who wanted to be rehabilitated and um, return to, to their functions. So yes, they are released, but they are well aware of the fact that they committed no crime and they want to be rehabilitated. That's of key importance uh, for, for them. The communist regime of the early 1960s is strong and it seems that it will be there throughout their lives. So the release is only a half victory. Thank you. We have another question here from um, Mr. Kotsian saying, if we look away from the specificity of Husak's case, did other released communists made efforts to become active again in political life? Or, well, I could say that they wanted to return to politics, but 
Jarmila Potučková, for instance, refused to return to politics when asked to do so uh, by Husak. It's a difficult struggle even within the party. After being released, Husak's work in Fkus, uh, tailoring company. He works as a worker, laborer, because he's told that he has no qualification. Then later on, he works in a, in a storage. Both his sons were studying back then and his salary was not very high. So it was a difficult period uh, for his family. When he can move on, he does so uh, within the party. He writes letters, very long letters to the party pointing at his unlawful uh, punishment, imprisonment. If we read those letters, it would take the entire time dedicated to this panel. This is about the length of his letters. Uh, we have here now, thank you. We have here now a few questions to Mr. Tsuhra. The first one is from Matej Bili. It concerns the religion, uh, asking the phenomenon of believing function functionaries. Back in the mid 1950s, for example, the leading district and regional secretaries openly declared their religion. Is there a time limit when this became completely unacceptable? Well, in 1950, Eight, this attitude became part of attacks on teachers, uh, public figures, etc. But until then, uh, the functionaries of the party uh, were attending uh, churches and they carried to do so throughout the existence. Husag was getting letters about um, communist functionaries attending church services. So, thank you. The second question is from Jakub Verba. I'll ask for the third time about Slovakia. Was the situation in Slovakia more tolerant towards Catholics in the party and later on? I know the saying that in Slovakia, even the district secretary went to church on Sundays. If so, is it possible to look for any continuities in Bohemia with the pre-war Czech national liberal anti-clericalism? Thank you. Can you hear me? Jarda. It looks that our colleague Tsuhra turned into stone. He's frozen. Well, he got disconnected now. Um, any other questions, comments? And I apologize to Mr. Verba and Schumichrast, who also had a question to Dr. Zuhra. Does any of you have a question or a comment to any of your colleagues? Oh, would you like to compliment? Yes, Jarda. Again, the mic needs to be on. Would you like me to reread the question since you are back? Oh, I haven't heard the question. Thank you for rereading it for me. 
Was the situation in Slovakia more tolerant to Catholics? I know the saying that in Slovakia, even the district secretary went to church on Sundays. If so, is it possible to look for any continuities in Bohemia with the pre-war Czech national liberal anti-clericalism? Thank you. Well, it's not an obvious answer. I do believe that it's not true that there was no big pressure on believers in Slovakia. The truth is that there were too many of them, so they couldn't deal with it. And this is related to the question in Bohemia, where all believers were much more visible. So if you went to church, they could actually see it. And yes, uh, there is uh, comments on the fact that uh, local secretary got buried in, in uh, Catholic uh, service, etc. But these are just, you know, individual examples. There was much pressure on not showing publicly uh, one's belief. The visibility of that was what made the party angry, what was problematic. If you signed up your child for religious religion classes, that was a problem. If you did it secretly, then it was okay. And last question from Adam Schumichrast. Is it possible to assess what impact the whole process of atheization in the past regime had on society beyond the repressive moment? How many people were completely converted or how many people at least gave up support for organized religion? Well, that's the first question ever that someone could ask. All I can do is speculate here. We are a much Austrian society, or very similar to it. In Austria, the religion survived in the society, whereas here, except for a short a uh, religious period in the early 1990s where people sought religion again to lean on something. What happened here is actually erasure of a meaningful um, right wing. No, I, I, really, I can't go on, I can't go on. It would be just too long. I think it was amazingly successful when it comes to destruction, but there was no positive success of these efforts. I hope that we answered Mr. Shumichas question, at least partially. Um, I took the floor from Mr. Grokowski before, I'm sorry for that. Would any one like to add something? Now is your chance. If not, then I would like to say goodbye. I would like to thank all our panelists for uh, their contributions. Very interesting ones. And I'm very happy to see how many people actually attended the panel on the, our YouTube channel. And please do come back at 1.30 to our following uh, part. Thank you. Thank you also to the interpreters. Um, See you later. Yeah. <laughs> 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 <laughs>